Right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Sanwal Yusuf. I use the him pronouns, and I am the chair of the Political Education Committee here at Philly DSA. And so today we're talking about libertarian socialism, what it is, and how it is different from more traditional forms of socialism that is understood by majority of people, whether that be democratic socialism, social democracy, Marxism, etc. Um, today we're um, I am. I run the the events and panel subcommittee in the political education committee, uh, committee, and we take up different interesting topics that are not usually covered as much, um, and try to offer a different vantage point to start studying and understanding socialism from. And libertarian socialism falls into that category. Where um, I think most people when they think of the word libertarian, they think of Ron Swanson, which is very very wrong. Uh, libertarian, the word itself, has very deep socialist roots and. There are many existing libertarian socialist experiments that are going on now, whether those be the Zapatistas or the Kurds in Rojava, et cetera, or Native Americans, different Native tribes. So that is what we hope to explore today. And to do that, uh, we're joined today by uh, John Michael Colon, uh, our very dear friend. He also John, um, he goes by GMC to his friends. So I hope we will be friends by the end of this session. He has a long list of stuff that he has done, so I'm going to have to read it off because I, there's no way I'm remembering it. Um, anyway, he's published essays in journalism and poetry in The Point, In These Times, Brooklyn Rail, Prelude, among other things. And he has done most of his work in the DSA Libertarian Socialist Caucus and the Symbios, uh, Symbiosis Federation as an activist. That's where he has done most of his work. And now he's a co-editor and worker owner of Strange Matters a cooperative magazine of the new and unconventional thinking in economics, philosophy, politics, and culture. And now I'm just gonna shut up and let GMC take over and be the interesting person in the room. Thank you so much, Samal. Um, I will try to be interesting, but I suppose that that's up to y'all and not up to me. Um, I'm also gonna try to be disciplined, uh, which I know is not a stereotypical anarchist characteristic, although you'd be surprised. Uh, so I'm just gonna put a timer to make sure that I'm, uh, on schedule here. Okay, so we're here today to talk about libertarian socialism. First part of this is gonna be me rambling for a little bit, and then it's gonna be more of like a back and forth group discussion is my understanding. And I suppose if you wanna know what libertarian socialism is, it might help to kind of get squared away on what socialism in general is and like the general shape of a socialist family tree. Um, this is surprisingly difficult um, to do even now after the socialist revival because there's a lot of misunderstandings that circulate quite widely about the nature of socialism. Uh, some of them kind of circulated among ordinary working people kind of, you know, like in the general miasma of mass media bourgeois ideology, and some of them kind of among the socialists themselves, especially when they kind of just say that like socialism is just my tradition and none of the other traditions. Um, so Socialism isn't when the government does things or owns things uh, necessarily. Uh, you can have government ownership without socialism. Uh, absolutely. Uh, it's also not like, you know, the kind of like paranoiac fantasies of anti-communist types, uh, you know, where, where the goal is to turn us all into kind of like regimented automatons in a collectivist society where everybody's the same and everybody's just a number, um, you know, and it's also not I would argue a uh, a ideal of a highly regimented society where all the social contradictions have been done away with, and you know we're all tended to by machines of loving grace, and there are no social problems anymore. Um, I think that if you go back to the history of what socialism was from the very beginning and what it consistently has been at its best, socialism is the dream of a society where ordinary working people are directly in charge of their lives, uh, where there is radical democracy in the workplace uh, and in our neighborhoods and cities, such that the people who are affected by decisions are the ones who are making the decisions. Um, uh, it's the dream of the factory workers running the factories, the, the peasants running the fields, uh, the service workers running the, you know, uh, the, the, the supermarkets, the, the hospital workers running the hospitals, all as a democracy and doing so not for profit, but uh, for in order to meet uh, people's basic needs as a human right um, without any kind of precondition, discrimination, etc. Um, and 
in order to kind of like see how that dream emerged, you kind of have to see what it was defining itself against. Um, so in the 19th century, there arose the first kind of like self-described socialist movements, although there have been uh, precedent beforehand, and they define themselves against the system of, well, oftentimes it wasn't called capitalism yet. That's kind of a late 19th century thing. Uh, they used to call it, um, they used to call it the wages system. And in a way that is kind of like, that remains a, a very nice term for what they were attacking because it's a system where you have these private absentee owners called capitalists who own all the key productive infrastructure of society. We're talking the land, the factories, the buildings, the roads, the railroads, the airports, power plants, power grids, you know, communication networks, banks, all of these privately owned. And as European post-Roman property law says, if something is your property, you can use and abuse it as you please. Um, and there are usually in these capitalist societies, complex legal institutions and systems um, such as corporations, um, you know, as a legal category and the protection for, uh, you know, for property owners through those systems. So you have to have the system of private ownership over the key infrastructure of society with the attendant legal system of private property that that implies. Then you have to have a system of wage labor where it's not just that these people own um, the, the, the actual productive plant, it's that they can compel people to work for them because people who usually would have been like peasants growing their own food and making their own clothes, uh, at least to some extent, uh, were forced off the land, often through extreme acts of state violence, whether it was the enclosure movement in, you know, the UK and, uh, and other European countries, or whether it was the process of, you know, the colonization of the developing world through European colonialism, um, you know, free, free peasants, uh, living living communally or uh, or or free you know tribes of indigenous people were basically cleared out so that the land could be parceled and handed off to these absentee owners what happened to the people who were living on that land well basically they have no means of making their own survival so they have to work for the assholes who took the land from them um, working first of all as tenant farmers on the land and then when industrialization started happening and there were factories working in the factories in the cities um, in order to be paid in tokens, in money that you use to buy the things that you need to survive, like your rent and your clothes and your food and all the rest of it. So in other words, because people were dependent on the market for survival, and the only way that you could get the money to buy things on the market is by working in these firms that are dictatorships of the absentee owners, you basically have a system of slavery with extra steps. Uh, and in fact, at the time in the 19th century, they called it wage slavery. And many people, both capitalists and anti-capitalists, would often refer to chattel slavery, where capitalists owned people literally, uh, and wage slavery as merely two different strategies by which capitalists could use their control over property and money to by the labor power of others, either directly uh, through slavery or indirectly through the wage contract. And then finally, when you have all these other things, you have the last component of the capital system, at least as I would describe it, uh, which is that, well, if all that is true, then that means that everything that happens in society, everything that gets made and everything that gets done, all production is directed to increase the profits and the powers of the big private owners rather than allowing, for example, every single person to have a house and health care as a human right. So the socialists, seeing these problems, define themselves against these problems. And they basically advocated for the idea, and still advocate to this day for the idea, that it should be not absentee owners who basically just live off of rents and capital gains, who make all the decisions uh, over everything and have control through the wages system over the labor power of other people, rather property should be collectively owned, especially this key productive infrastructure that we use to make everything um, through one scheme or another. Ordinary working people should collectively own that and use it, manage it democratically in order to meet everybody's needs as a human right so that we no longer have child labor, so that we no longer have homelessness, so that we no longer have people uh, dying due to their, you know, from perfectly preventable diseases for lack of health care or, you know, going into basically bankruptcy, trying to pay for cancer treatment and other very familiar indignities of the capital system past and present. So that sounds great. I think that everybody here pretty much already has a certain um, 
you know, affection for this kind of perspective, because otherwise, why would you be at a DSA meeting? But the trouble, of course, is that what I just said is a very, very general prescription, right? Like beyond these, the, these kinds of broad contours, and there are socialists who would even disagree with a couple of things that I just said, right? But beyond this very broad consensus, um, socialists disagree actually quite rapidly about um, exactly how you're supposed to get the collective ownership, the democratic management, the decommodification of basic needs, and the ability of everyone to, uh, you know, fully self-actualize in some kind of more democratic uh, democratic economy. People don't really agree about this, um, and there are and always have been many types of socialists. I think that that's actually a really important thing to kind of internalize because, um, especially in DSA, we kind of have this culture. And I've been at multiple DSA meetings where, you know. You'll you'll have somebody who kind of raises their hand uh, in or or gets or gets in staff and is like, well, you know, as Marxists, we all agree that you know, blah 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 blah. And I mean, that's just one in example, albeit a very common one, of the kind of like chauvinism that you get from particular socialist traditions um, trying to make themselves the universal socialist tradition. All the other socialisms are just fake. Um, if you take a more open-minded view. Um, that kind of talks about the tradition kind of in all its expansiveness and especially in the way that it's um, that it's been prominent um, in movements that are not the familiar ones from Europe and Russia and North America uh, in certain time periods, then what you'll find is that there are lots and lots of different socialisms. Um, I would classify them, generally speaking, into two large kind of functional families, one of which, which is not always how like people identified at the time, but is kind of like based on like the general kind of shared strategies within within them. Um, there is a kind of state socialist family, um, which by one means or another believes in taking over the state in order to uh, in order to implement socialism, usually through some kind of like collectivized property through the state. Now within state socialism, there are a lot of like really important distinctions because you have, you know, on the one hand, people like Babouf and people like Blanqui in the 19th century. And I would argue, although this is a controversial point, um, you know, the various Leninist traditions of the 20th century, um, not only Lenin himself, but Stalin, Mao, you know, Pol Pot, whoever you want, um, the, uh, there is a tradition that basically sees the that process of taking over the state and the kind of state that develops as uh, some kind of authoritarian uh, state ownership secured, you know, usually through like a coup or a putsch, uh, you know, of some sort or uh, or ideally some kind of general revolutionary insurrection, but which is nevertheless channeled through a minority um, and must be established by a minority because only the most advanced socialists can act decisively and in a coordinated fashion to overthrow the old capitalist order. You can't wait for the ordinary working people to catch up. They haven't had the development yet that would allow them to run things themselves. Um, now, some people would argue that that's a bit of a caricature, but it is certainly uh, in its results, a uh, common tendency, regardless of the intention of the people kind of pursuing that kind of path. And there's another kind of state socialist that basically sees the democratic republic uh, that was invented by liberals in the 19th century as basically the, 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 the mechanism for achieving some kind of state ownership. And perhaps the state ownership itself is the socialism, and perhaps it's kind of like in the process of handing it off somehow. So this kind of Democratic Republican socialism is something that you see from uh, characters like Louis Blanc in the 19th century, uh, not to be confused with Blanqui, I know it's confusing, um, and most famously Marx and Engels, who at least in some of their writing um, are interested precisely in like you know, creating the, the, the dictatorship of the proletariat for them is a democratic republic, at least in texts like the Communist Manifesto. In other texts, it kind of becomes something that looks a lot more like anarcho-syndicalism in the, in the Paris, uh, uh, the, the, the Civil War in France or whatever. It, it gets kind of confusing because they wish, they're wishy-washy about this, uh, but that's generally the kind of range of the state socialist traditions. Um, and, and there can be, you know, within that distinction, reformists and revolutionaries. Um, the other family of socialism, which has often in many times and places been a rival to the state socialist traditions, is the tradition or traditions of libertarian socialism. Now, 
like the state socialists, libertarian socialists aren't just a single ideology, but generally speaking, they're people who are interested not in using the state, especially not a dictatorial state, but even a representative liberal democracy as the mechanism for enacting socialism, because for them, socialism means fundamentally ordinary working people being directly in control over the economic structures that affect their lives. So if they're not the ones making the decisions, if they're deferring it to some external representative, it is not socialism. Um, it, now, at best, it is some kind of like transitional thing that might move you closer to socialism compared to, I don't know, like a czarist dictatorship or something, but it is not the thing itself. And from a libertarian socialist perspective, what you want to do is to build the thing itself. So these, Libertarian socialists, broadly speaking, tend to pursue one of several strategies or, uh, or they pursue the strategies in combination to create non-state socialist institutions. Um, in, in, the, uh, in the modern day, in the last 10 years especially, the, the term dual power uh, institution has kind of caught on as a, as a typical kind of way of talking about what this kind of institution looks like because it forms a, a contrary power to the, the, the state institutions and the capitalist institutions that currently dominate society. Um, and the thing that defines a dual power institution from this point of view is that it is fine. It is it has real control over some kind of like biophysical resources. It's not just like, you know, um, a bunch of people volunteering their labor hours. There's actual resources to control. Um, those resources are controlled directly democratically by working class people, uh, which means that like you don't have this kind of like intermediary of the state representatives who then appoint the people who are the head of the national health service or whatever you run the national health service yourself in fact the first healthcare systems in europe were not welfare state um they were things like the um like the uh, the the workers insurance companies and the bourses du travail uh that the french syndicalists for example created um, and even more strikingly, the first National Health Service was not the British National Health Service. It was the uh, kind of confederational health service, I guess you could call it, that the Spanish anarchists put together the CNTFAI during the Civil War, um, which uh, basically collectivized all the doctors in the hospitals um, on a pretty much voluntary basis and actually like worked really well um, and served for some people as a model for the kinds of thing that you could do um, through the state um, for some social Democrats, I mean. Um, so anyway, the uh, so non-state institutions that can and non-capitalist institutions that are run directly by ordinary working people in a direct democracy. They control real resources and they use those resources to struggle for their own liberation in the present. But also, they are the germ potentially in most kind of libertarian socialist theories of transition for future socialist institutions tomorrow. In other words, like what it means to build socialism is to build these spaces um, where we already are running production and investment ourselves as a direct democracy and it's working class people deciding what their own fate is going to be and what it would mean to have socialism in society is for those institutions to reach a critical mass and replace the capitalist and uh, uh, and state institutions uh, that you know perhaps they have useful functions and we can get rid of the useless functions and have these institutions replace their useful functions. Um, so that basically tends to be the libertarian socialist type theory. And you know there's different variations of this. So for example, there's lots of people who are interested in building communes, housing collectives, um, other forms of like, you know, living together that have some form of like direct democratic decision making and resource distribution. And uh, the classical commune movement often failed, you know, people like Robert Owen, the Fourierists, Gustav Landauer, uh, and all this other stuff, because they tried to be kind of like agricultural and self-sufficient. But in the late 20th century, there's actually been like a lot more experimentation in intentional communities and things like that, that have actually shown that they can last whole decades. And of course, there's problems. And it's interesting to kind of look at those problems. But um, if you hang out in like socialist spaces long enough, you'll actually run into a surprising number of people who live in like a community land trust, or a housing cooperative, or other kinds of institutions that people think of as extremely utopian, um, but are oftentimes like, you know, run directly democratic they're communal internally, you know, in terms of their resources, blah, 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 blah. And they also serve as kind of like launch pads for 
other militant social movements. So they're not just like neutral and isolated and trying to go it alone and forgetting about changing the system. You've also got obviously the cooperative movement. And again, the cooperative movement isn't like consistently always 100% socialist, but socialists have been at the forefront of the cooperative movement from the very beginning. And cooperatives from a libertarian socialist point of view are at least part of the way towards being a socialist institution because they are run, uh, they are putting, uh, you know, production directly under the control of the workers of the workplace. And uh, the, uh, they obviously face many institutional obstacles, but, you know, when they, when they do grow, you can get things like the, uh, the multinational Mondragon Corporation, which is like the third largest corporation in Spain, and it's run as a cooperative and basically provides uh, a ton of employment in the town that it's based in, um, basically helped industrialize it. Um, there's also a very long history of radical socialistic Black cooperative movements in the United States, which is very little known known. Um, Strange Matters actually is going to publish an article about this by the great economist and historian Jessica gordon Nemhard, um, who herself has participated in these movements. Um, and uh, the, uh, uh, essentially, the, the, uh, uh, there's a direct lineage that you can trace from those movements to the civil rights movement, uh, because the uh, they were the economic backbone of a lot of the civil rights organizations, and they got started like right after slavery. In fact, they there were mutual aid societies of enslaved people themselves that actually preceded uh, the uh, the 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 uh, civil rights movement. Sorry, not the the cooperative movement. Uh, and um, there was a fact that I forgot. Sorry. Oh. Uh, course. Um, th that is the lineage that in many ways has produced famous revolutionary organizations that a lot of us know about nowadays uh, called the, uh, 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 like such as Cooperation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, um, which, um, which is directly kind of inspired by and trying to kind of continue on the legacy of that tradition. Uh, then of course there's syndicalism, which is the basic idea that, hey, we have these trade unions, they fight for higher wages. What if A, we ran them as radical democracies, the unions, and B, they didn't just agitate for higher wages, they agitated for like more control over the work process itself, such that C, if a revolutionary situation ever comes around, the union, which already knows how to run things democratically because it runs itself democratically, can just take over the factory and run it democratically. Um, so uh, most famously, the Spanish Civil War, uh, the Spanish Revolution aspect of the Spanish Civil War had the CNTFAI do exactly this. And 50 years of self-management really did pay off because they did actually run the territories that they controlled in Catalonia and other parts of Spain uh, as radical democracies. And they ran the economy that way. And obviously they lost the Civil War, but in the interim, uh, quite miraculous things were happening. I mean, they were they were collectivizing land and increasing agricultural output on it at the same time, which is kind of unheard of, but they were using a voluntary process that uh, worked a lot better than Stalinism. Uh, they uh, they were able to, despite very few resources, actually create some like uh, industrial materials like tanks out of cars, uh, which otherwise they would have had to import, but they couldn't because it was the Soviets who controlled the gold supply and all this other kind of stuff that is too much to get into, but goes to show you like the kind of power that comes from 50 years of practice already running the union as the democracy that you want to eventually live in. There are other examples, of course, of syndicalist unions. You've got the IWW in the United States, the CGT in France. Um, and uh, But you've also got like the kind of informal syndicalism that happens when um, workers kind of in a wildcat way without formal organization take over factories and just run them democratically. Um, there was a, a huge wave of that in the 1920s in countries like Italy. Um, it happened again in Argentina in the 2000s, um, and uh, there, there are, and I believe that there's a famous fact in Greece that uh, that during the kind of like collapse of the economy in the 2010s uh, had a similar kind of like wildcat strike that ended up turning it into a effectively a, a co-op. Uh, so, um, and I would also count. Um, the council communist movement of the early 20th century, even though they define themselves against the syndicalists, so they get really mad, or people who are fans of them nowadays get really mad if you call them syndicalists. In this big picture sense, they were kind of syndicalists in the more like wildcat way because they wanted to create these new workers' councils that would be more radical than the existing unions and basically run industry uh, collectively, although they were organized geographically rather than by workplace. Um, 
And then finally, there's the municipalists who um, tend to want to, um, they see the city, especially the city or the municipality, like the town, as the, the organic and sensible unit of worker control, because it's relatively easy for workers to take it over. And, uh, and also because like, you know, compared to like a whole country, and also because it's where people live, and people aren't just worker workers, right? Like they also like, live together in communities they want to shape the way that those cities are formed and like you know whether there's parks and all this other stuff so socializing things doesn't just mean the workplace it has to mean these kinds of investment decisions in the city as well so municipalists tend to advocate for one or the other sort of socialism in one city and the libertarian socialist wing of municipalism is one that wants to replace city government as we understand it with radical direct democracy uh, on the level of the neighborhood everybody has a neighborhood council you um you know you make decisions in the neighborhood council like big decisions such as like do we want to build this park or do we want to do something with this old building etc cetera, etc cetera. uh and then you execute on the decision and any decision that requires resources that you yourself don't have you can take to a larger uh kind of um structure that is citywide uh and that is made up as a federation of the different neighborhoods um so the the they're the most famous theorist of uh, libertarian socialist municipalism or libertarian municipalism for short is Murray Bookchin, who, um, you know, uh, libertarian socialist types will usually tell you to Google him. That's one of the reasons why. Um, but uh, Bookchin's biggest influence was not actually in the United States. Uh, it was abroad, uh, partly through like European movements like Barcelona and Comu, um, uh, and he also inspired Cooperation Jackson as well. Uh, but really what everybody knows as like the most radical municipalist movement on the planet is the, uh, the and they're not reducible to municipalism, they're doing other things too, but it's the, um, the 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 Rojava revolution mm -hmm. in northern Syria, uh, which has basically along Bookchinite lines created a system of uh, direct democratic assemblies in cities, uh, in the cities that they control, uh, that give people a direct say in you know their their lives in in their local area and then they've kind of confederated them in order to be organs of direct democratic self-governance over very large scale social issues uh like basically all the public utilities for example um and also like the the initiatives to do like economic development and cooperativism and stuff like that all of that is kind of organized through the assembly system uh and then various like uh working group type things that are built up out of it um the uh, so so this gives you a sense, I think, of the kind of range of strategies that libertarian socialists tend to look for, and what they all have in common is, I would argue, this dual power approach. Uh, that's not the term that they would have used in their own time, many of these movements, but it's the one that um, the North American libertarian socialist movement has kind of settled upon. And it's a good general term for this because you, it's about creating socialist institutions that are not under the control of some state bureaucrat, not under the control of some capitalists, but are under the direct democratic control of the working classes themselves. And the working classes will use those resources that they decide what they're gonna do with together in order to liberate themselves. Here in the present, in the sense that it can be a bolstering of their, um, you know, of, of their current social movements, but then also tomorrow when, the, when those institutions become the governing institutions of a whole different society. So that's the kind of like practical side of libertarian socialism. And you'll notice that I haven't dropped a lot of ideological names. I haven't been talking to you about Kropotkin or Emma Goldman or Subcomandante Marcos or, you know, or, um, like or any any anybody right like you know that uh that that has or any specific isms like anarcho-communism or uh anarcho-collectivism or you know uh, uh libertarian marxism of the daniel goron type or autonomous mm -hmm. marxism of the italian upper arista type and it's not that i'm trying to be dismissive of these isms it's that sometimes we get kind of stuck in my opinion in the isms and we kind of like learn about them by going on marxist.org or the anarchist library and kind of like identify with them and then we filter everything through like that ism and the various texts associated with it on those databases and i think that this can be a very uh debilitating uh thing that happens because we get stuck in those labels and we don't think about like what's underneath the labels because ultimately things aren't really what they 
call themselves or what they claim to be or what they want to be. Things are what they do. That's, 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 that's what a thing is. And I would argue that if you want to define libertarian socialism in a useful way, it's not as an ideology, it's as a set of practices. And these are the practices of the wing of the socialist movement that believes, you know, using different labels in different times and places, generally in the construction of these independent working class institutions uh, that would be the germ of a future social society. Having now kind of like done that general broad overview, what I would like to do is to, um, is to just talk a little about um, kind of the organizational practices that, uh, that libertarian socialists are liable to adopt. Um, here, I think that it's useful to, so, so just to give you guys a sense, um, I've avoided talking about this because it's very complex, but um, there are like libertarian socialists who are not Marxists. And in fact, the most famous libertarian socialist traditions are non-Marxist socialist traditions, most famously, and also most kind of like, you know, in terms of numbers, at least in the 19th and 20th centuries, the anarchist movement, right? The anarchist movement is not a separate movement from socialism. It's the left wing of socialism, or at least it believes itself to be the left wing of socialism. Uh, the anti-authoritarian wing of socialism that doesn't want a transitional period where we have to patiently wait uh, until we're, you know, good little kids and then we can get rewarded with socialism after some years of, like, you know, putting it off. Uh, and also don't want um, the uh, socialism to come through the state. In fact, they often don't believe that it can come through the state, but rather uh, demand socialism right away and socialism specifically as the, um, as is this like form of uh, extreme radical uh, direct democracy. Uh, although some anarchists don't like that language, which is a whole other debate. Um, I think that anarchism is best understood as one wing of the libertarian socialist movements, because there are many libertarian socialists uh, in the last hundred years, and especially in the last like 50 years, who are from other socialist traditions, whether it's cooperativism, which is another kind of non-Marxist socialist tradition, at least in its origins, um, or like the black socialist movement, for example, or I mean, most um, most notably from Marxism, right? There are whole wings of Marxism that have kind of defected from the state socialist politics generally associated with Marxism and basically adopt um, what you could loosely call the anarchistic methods. Um, so again, I'm thinking of you know uh, autonomous Marxism, um, some of the post-Trotskyist currents in Latin America associated with the factory occupations, um, the 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 uh, the. Uh, the, the council communist movements that emerged in the wake of the Eastern European revolutions in the 1910s, uh, which was not just the Russian, although it included it. Uh, there was a wider kind of Soviet or council movement that actually stretched into Central Europe, like Germany. Um, and people like the Spartacus uprising were a part of it. Um, the, the, you know, there, there are all these wings of Marxism that basically do these libertarian socialist methods. So if, if you're trying to kind of like understand what the relationship between Marxism and libertarian socialism is, I would recommend that you think of it as like, um, there are libertarian socialists. Some of those libertarian socialists are Marxists. Some of those libertarian socialists are not Marxists. And on the other hand, there are Marxists who are not libertarian socialists. In fact, arguably most Marxists, although it depends on the time and place. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's one element of the problem. The other thing is the relationship between libertarian socialism and anarchism. And that's a very complicated one because the anarchist movement in Europe was probably the first or at least the most prominent libertarian socialist movement in, um, you know, in that milieu. So people oftentimes make libertarian socialism a synonym for anarchism. But there's now also like these currents, um, some of them quite like successful, that are not anarchists and would disagree with anarchists on certain things, like, you know, how dogmatically you have to oppose the welfare state or something like that. Um, so basically, I would say that, like, you can kind of think of it in either, like, you know, for those of you who know geometry, uh, it's a law in geometry, all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares in a similar way. 
all anarchists are libertarian socialists, but not all libertarian socialists are anarchists. Um, but another way that you can look at it is as a spectrum. Libertarian socialisms differ amongst each other on the specifics. How much do you engage with the more democratic kinds of state? What precisely do you do about markets? Different, you know, preferred organs and tools of direct democracy. We've gone through a number of them. But what unites them is that they're at least tending towards something that we might call anarchy, at least an anarchist would call it anarchy. And that's not a narrow political position like anarchism. It's a kind of like philosophical anarchism. It's a more general, broad, animating ideal. Um, and the basic ideal is that um, the that you don't have rulers. Um, if you if you stipulate that human beings can only flourish where there's liberty and equality, and that these two go together, you can only have either if you have both, which is a very different thing from what liberals believe. Um, well, you know, if you believe that, because for example, you believe that everybody can only be sure that they're going to remain their own master if there are no masters over anybody else and everybody has an equal say in decision making and everybody having the same right to meet their basic economic needs will never happen if some ruling elite is making the decisions. If you believe these things, which I think are pretty common sense, especially from the study of history, at least in my biased opinion, then that means that egalitarian freedom is the only true kind of freedom, or at least the only assured kind of freedom. But where does such freedom exist? in a society without rulers, a society that was a radical democracy where ordinary people are running their own lives through some sort of um, you know, collective inst decision-making institution. And so I think that that kind of helps focus on the kinds of organizational methods that uh, libertarian socialists use because we, we are not, we are at the at the very least skeptics of and oftentimes actively hostile towards the notion that if you have an election, you know, and you elect someone to represent you and they're making all the decisions, that's great because that's, you know, that that solves the problem. Um, you know, that it, we basically believe that that doesn't solve the problem. Um, and that's for a couple different reasons. Um, like, on the one hand, you have the 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 fact that they can uh, essentially like you know make uh, if if they coordinate you know if you have like an elected representative congress or something they coordinate amongst themselves or collude with some external third party like a rich capitalist you know um, the the and do basically their bidding you're basically shit out of luck especially if they rig the you know election process um to uh to make sure that like only they or people like them uh get elected and you know only following the agendas of their donors or whoever stuffed the election committee or whatever which is you know par for the course in elected systems whether it's the national government of the united states um you know under basically like a capitalist regime uh or whether it's uh you know a dsa chapter that where like things are engineered in such a way as to not have, you know, an open democratic process because like people who dissent from what the clique that stuffed the relevant committee just don't get platformed and don't get the chance to, you know, have their voices be heard. There's certain things that one hears about, um, you know, um, and I'm sure that y'all are familiar with, uh, with that kind of stuff in DSA. So, um, the benefits of direct democracy, and it's not like there aren't detriments, but the, the, the basic benefits of direct democracy is that when the people who are making the decisions are, are also the ones who are affected by the decisions, there's going to be a kind of more um, practical, hands-on kind of orientation, uh, because it's very different from like a situation where you're in the room and there's a bunch of other people listening quietly as somebody presents on the front, you know, uh, and then you have to follow their orders. Otherwise, you get, you know, punished somehow. Um, in a voluntary group, it'll be that you get kicked out, right? It's a very different process when you're in a circle and there's some kind of procedure so that everybody can, like, have a say. Um, and then you figure out, like, you know, how you're going to do stuff together. And then having decided on that, you execute on it. There's a weird thing that happens where, A, things get more hands-on and practical because you're the people who are going to be executing the decision, right? So, like, that's – so the, the, the consideration of what the decision ought to be is going to have that in mind. B, 
there's like this thing that happens, especially when the assembly is well run, where you can't in a voluntary group force people to do what you want to do. Like if you if you have a 50% plus one majority uh, that says like, okay, there's eight, pe- there's nine people and five of them want to do something and four of them don't. And like the four really don't, it's a strong objection. I mean, you can try to, to structure that in such a way that like the, you can force the other ones to just do what you want, but they're going to walk away. And now instead of the power of nine people, you have the, uh, the, the, the power of five people. Um, so the, there are ways around this, but one of the best ways is to formalize procedures as often happens in direct democratic systems, whereby there's some kind of consensus. If somebody has an objection, the typical thing to do, at least as a first recourse in the system ought to be to listen to the objection and try to integrate it into the proposal, right? So it's like, like you know, somebody is really strongly opposes doing this. Well, you can get more buy-in and maybe even convince them to vote for it if you modify it on the fly in order to address that objection. And if at the end of it, you now have like, you know, seven out of nine, that's a much better situation because that basically means that there's more chance that the that you get follow through in the process and of course you can have consensus systems um you know in place in a representative system but when it's a direct you know that that doesn't solve the gap fundamentally that exists between you know the the people making the decisions and the people executing when you have both the direct democratic element and the consensus element you oftentimes have um much more rich and much more robust buy-in um so that like actually more people get off their ass and do the thing uh, than would have if they were just like kind of receiving the order from the top down, especially if they're not being paid, um, the, which, which kind of also maybe can illuminate some elements of the capitalist system and why it is the way that it is. Um, so um, I think that that I'm almost at my time, I think. I've got like one minute left. I would like to talk about um, I would like to talk about the um, the kinds of um, structures that tend to form in libertarian socialist movements, and also the more kind of like successful libertarian socialist movements that have existed in history. Because it, again, contrary to a lot of the propaganda that you hear, uh, libertarian socialism has at time been the dominant form of socialism in different uh, countries and different times and places. Most famously in Spain. Uh, where it was hegemonic um, all through the kind of late 19th and early 20th century, but also in um, like large parts of uh, Latin America, in the uh, in Southeast Asia and the Pacific in the turn of the 20th century. It was actually anarchists who were part of the first like anti-colonial movements and a lot of anti-colonial movements in places as far afield as like China and Japan and the Philippines and Korea, like actually like were initially started up by anarchists who were reading Kropotkin or were converted to anarchism by reading Kropotkin. Um, you know, um, the, uh, and, uh, you, you know, you had great libertarian social revolutions against Leninist regimes, like in 1956 in Hungary, um, uh, again, brutally crushed because it was basically ordinary working people who had been living under Leninism, hadn't had the opportunity to freely organize, uh, you know, the, the, like some kind of like, you know, syndicalist solution for like factory committees so they could have practice running society, you know, and be, you know, up on their feet enough to create the tanks that would counter the Soviet tanks. So they got crushed, but it was a huge, I mean, they basically like overthrew the Leninist government effectively. And we're going to do what Lenin said that he was going to do in the twenties, which is like give all power to the Soviets, um, workers councils. So, um, the, and then, um, like, like there's also the example of the Mexican Revolution, which was actually the first great revolution of the 20th century, not the Russian. Um, and it occurred in, it started in the, uh, oh, now I suck with dates, so now I'm going to mess it up. But I believe it started in the, uh, in the early 1910s, uh, I'm going to say, and then probably somebody's going to look it up and make me look silly. But anyway, um, the, and um the, the, the thing that people don't really know about the Mexican Revolution, which had many, many political factions, and was very, very confusing, but nevertheless, 
all the radical left-wing factions of the Mexican Revolution that we would think of as socialists were basically libertarian socialists because basically what happens is that there were two huge influences in the uh, in the Mexican Revolution that produced the kinds of um, you know worker control based socialisms uh, that existed there. One was um, the, uh, the the people who were reading uh, Proudhon in the 19th century and kind of like European anarchism. Um, the other was indigenous indigenous traditions because um, the indigenous peoples who lived in the state that became Mexico, um, many of them had direct democratic practices, especially on like the village or town level um, and uh, collectivist democratic type institutions in terms of how they uh, governed agriculture, most famously the milpa. Um, and uh, they, uh, they basically, when industrialization happened, they either extrapolated from you know, agriculture to industry or proposed for themselves because most indigenous people in Mexico were the Mexican peasantry. It's basically in the Mexican political context as in many countries in Latin America, it's basically the same thing. They proposed peasant socialism, at least in the countryside. Um, and the, we, we most famously know this as Zapatismo, but in fact, Zapatismo was just like one phase in this kind of agrarian socialist or peasant socialist movement that goes back to the 19th century and just continues through the 20th century as this massive influence in Mexican politics. It basically was the heart of the revolution because it was the revolt of the peasants which ultimately just toppled the uh, technocratic liberal porfiriato that had uh, that was the uh, the, the government uh, before the revolution. And um, there was also a very strong anarcho-syndicalist movement in the urban centers, very much like European anarcho-syndicalism, um, that wanted uh, to run the factories. And in fact, the critical moment of the, of the Mexican revolution where um, Pancho Villa, who's like a democratic state socialist, and Zapata, who's like the general of the you know peasant army that believed in agrarian socialism, they were defeated by the constitutionalists, which is like uh, the Mexican equivalent of the like uh, cadets or something like that, um, if you're using the Russian Civil War. They were defeated, but only because the urban anarcho-syndicalists, basically for racist and uh, and bigoted reasons against indigenous people, betrayed the the the, the rural like Zapatista agrarian socialist movement that was just as libertarian socialist as them. They were all like direct democracy, like all the stuff that I'm talking about in my big libertarian socialist bubble. That was that was what they were. They betrayed them because the constitutionalists offered them a deal, and basically a lot of them were like you know more educated workers. Um, you know, uh, with a bias against like the religiousness of the peasants and the backwardness of the peasants, like very like uh, kind of like uh, you know, almost Bolshevik sounding language, but they were libertarian socialists about like, you know, how the peasants had to be done away with so that we can industrialize and all this other stuff. And uh, they basically took that deal and then they got screwed because they, they, they narrowly won those battles, which led the right wing of the revolution to win. And then Funnily enough, the defeated peasants got all their demands, uh, or at least not all their demands, because they wanted like, you know, a Mexican, um, you know, libertarian socialist democracy. But in terms of like, like land reform, they got like a shit ton of their demands through the Ajito system, because like, literally, it didn't matter that they'd been defeated in the war. Everyone was so terrified that they would revolt again, that they had to give them what they wanted. Meanwhile, these urban workers, the anarcho syndicalists in the cities, they got nothing after they had basically been the ones who threw the war in the favor of the right. So I think that this shows you that libertarian socialists can be like the decisive faction, even in like the most kind of classical civil war revolution type situation where you think that only the strong survive and that's why we need centralization on the state and so on. Um, the, and, uh, and then the, the two kind of most living libertarian socialist examples, and then I'll stop, but I would be happy to elaborate on them in questions is the, uh, the, the neo zapatista phenomenon in Chiapas, where large parts of southern Mexico are basically uh, run directly by the descendants of the classical Zapatistas that I'm talking about uh, from the 30s and 20s, uh, sorry, 10s, 20s, and 30s, uh, the, the, you know, now their, their uh, descendants um, are basically uh, self-governing in large parts of southern Mexico and have been for 20 years. Um, and that's, I forget the numbers there, but that's like uh, 500,000 people or something like that. So 
uh, the and, and that's not counting the kind of larger scale movements outside of Chiapas that are directly inspired by the same Zapatismo uh, type ideology uh, and have the same kind of agrarian socialist tendencies, like, for example, the movement that liberated the and, and not just uh, agrarian socialists, but indigenous socialists as well. Uh, you know, like the movement that liberated the city of Chiran, which basically kicked out all the political parties, all the cops, and uh, and all the uh, narcos, and basically started running the city as a direct democracy. Still exists. You can go visit it. My friends have. I have not yet, but it's like a place that you can go. It's not a fictional um, thing. So uh, that's, of course, the one very successful libertarian socialist movement. And then the other one, of course, is Rojava, which in the system that I was kind of loosely and quickly describing before, that is a system that millions of people live under. It defeated ISIS, um, you know, it, militarily. It is constructing a pluralistic society that's a multi-ethnic society where, uh, you know, with, with a good amount of like, you know, free speech and civil liberties and all the stuff that liberals like, but also sincere attempts to collectivize the economy through cooperatives and through these like municipal assembly type things. Um, millions of people live under it. Uh, it's not perfect. There's many problems, but many different people from many different political ideologies who have gone there basically agree that it's a sincere attempt and it's also better than basically everything else that exists surrounding it. Uh, and that's libertarian socialism in action, creating hope for people on the other side of the planet, um, you know, because there's tons of people here in North America who are so inspired by the stuff that's going on in Chiapas and Rojava that they want to make it happen here. Not least uh, is, you know, Cooperation Jackson that I already mentioned in Mississippi, but also organizations like the Symbiosis Federation, of which Cooperation Jackson is a part, and that has um, groups across North America. And of course, affiliates within DSA of these organizations like the DSA Libertarian Socialist Caucus. So I hope that that is, I know that I, probably went over my time a little here. Um, but uh, yeah, 48. So sorry, I failed in my attempt at discipline. Um, but, um, but I would say that I can probably wrap it up there. Um, and I would be happy to answer any questions that y'all have, or even just have it be like a more open, general discussion between all of us. Uh, I, um, and uh, I should have said this at the start, but thank you so much for uh, inviting me to uh, to give this little spiel and I hope that you found it helpful and uh, because you know ultimately I don't think that it's talking about these things that kind of change your life and convert you to it uh, it was only when I actually started like participating in spaces that were run this way and that uh, and that do it well that I realized we can run everything this way and uh, if you feel a similar way um, let's talk and let's see let's see if we can make it happen yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for um, that uh, introduction to libertarian socialism. Um, for questions, usually the way we do it is like, I would ask people to write it in the chat and then read out the questions. And I think it seems weird to do that for libertarian socialism when we are talking about direct democracy. So if you feel like it uh, and you want to come off mute, just come up with your question, just raise your hand and then come off um, come up with your question. Uh, and if you wanna just uh, say it yourself, or if you want me to say it, just uh, type it in the chat and I'll read out the question. Um, and if anybody hasn't um, already filled out the survey, I will drop the survey again, which is just a sign in sheet. Um, and I'm asking for that because uh, JMC submitted a bunch of things as a follow up reading and, and resources to use. So I'll send it to all, everybody who fin fills up that, um, that survey. Um, Yes, I'm just gonna drop that here real quick. And for everybody who is watching on the on the YouTubes, I will drop those links in the description if you wanna read up on anything after this. So let's start off with like some questions. Um, I'll be the first one to kick off. You mentioned uh, Zapatistas and uh, Rojava. Now, I think most people when they think of politics and like decisions, um, they're always thinking about like bills, et cetera, like things coming through and like being watered on. Uh, how does how does decision making work in places like Zapatistas with the Zapatistas or Rojava? Like, is there a way uh, of how any issues that are brought up by the people are decided on collectively? And what happens if there is a disagreement between the federated structures and like the, the smaller town committees? Sorry, I muted myself. Um, the, I mean, that's going to depend 
on, on it's difficult to generalize because like it's it's going to depend on like not only like which system are you talking about Rojava or Chiapas or whatever um, but also like um, you know uh, even like local places will have different dynamics and the 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 thing of course right is that like uh, the and I'll stop hedging after this and give a real answer but it's an important hedge um, these systems can go awry. I don't want to like, you know, give anybody the impression that this, that this, that it's impossible once you've established a direct democratic system for somebody to consolidate a bunch of power and turn it into a, you know, top down despotism or have, or for some click within it to exert social pressure, you know, in a loose way that, that like, you know, makes it intimidating for everybody else and then basically imposes their will that way, or for any number of different things that could go wrong to go wrong, uh, people not stepping up enough to do the things that have to get done to maintain the space. And then it kind of like, like dwindles away. All this stuff can happen and does happen. And um, libertarian socialism, um, you know, in practice is kind of a catalog of experiments that you then have to like learn from and be like okay this is i remember this this is one of the ways that it can go wrong so what's a trick that can kind of like circumvent that um so in order to try to answer your question a little more directly like i think that um you know there are different practices that are really striking um that are from my still limited i have to look through some of the PDFs that I have that are a little more in depth, like case studies of like how stuff happens on the ground, surprisingly hard to find those, but I have a couple off the top of my head. So one that is very famous is that in Rojava, um, which is in the Middle East, which has, you know, uh, a major patriarchy problem. I mean, all places do obviously, but like the, 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 the feminist movements have particularly struggled in the Middle East in the last couple of decades with the rise of like very, very brutal dictatorships that have repressed feminist movements just like they've repressed everyone else, but with a kind of special movements uh, due to the way that it kind of ties into religion and all this other stuff. So the, I think that the, uh, you know, the, the revolution in Rojava very self-consciously developed structures, knowing that even in a, you know, an environment where theoretically we're all democratic, direct democratic and equal, and everybody has an equal say, in a society where that's the context, women need to have like their own, not only like their own spaces to organize, like their own caucuses, but actually like institutionalizing that in the decision making such that, for example, if there are point people for a working group or like, you know, or spokespeople or people who are like on an administrative committee that has to report back to the general group or all these other kinds of things, there always has to be, you know, one, one man and one woman. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, like, you know, this, this, there's complications even to that gender politics, and I don't want to romanticize it, but one of the things that literally everyone who goes to Rojava says is how much this has radically transformed, like, not just the politics, uh, because, you know, the, the, the policies that are arrived at are kind of different, you know, than they would have been otherwise, but also, like, the, the um, you know, the culture broadly of, of Rojava. Um, similarly, you know, there's, there's many, many, many sorts of like, you know, procedures for adjudicating disputes that exist in indigenous traditions that have influenced the kind of agrarian socialism of the Zapatistas, um, which they implement in the Caracoles, uh, which is like their local, their local governance structures um, that they use on the, on the town level. Uh, and, uh, you know, like, what they'll do if people have an issue with each other is that they'll have a very long meeting. And it's actually a very distinct cultural difference from the way that it works here in the States, because here in the States, we're all working nine to fives. Um, the, uh, you know, especially in like urban areas, but like there, well, I guess there's in the States, there's less of a difference between urban areas and rural areas in this respect, but in rural areas in Mexico, people don't have like the kind of like nine to fives where they have to be like worrying about getting to the office the next day or whatever. There's a lot more kind of like classical peasantry, like, you know, they, uh, they, they own their own land and so on, uh, you know, and then they like work it when and how they please and they can take breaks for like a whole week collectively in the whole community. So part of what happens as a result of that is that the meeting culture is just very different like our meeting culture is all about respecting people's time making sure that everybody limits themselves to like little things of like two minutes so that everybody can get a say their meeting culture is like okay we're having issues let's like take an entire week 
to have very long meetings where everybody really gets a say, including like long rambly says or like working out disagreements and blah, 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 blah. And then we work it out. And of course, like that's different material conditions make different actions possible. But, um, you know, having witnessed several of these, um, you know, my friends, not I, but my friends who I, I talk to very closely have been like very, very impressed at the kinds of things that you can get done like in terms of like even things like conflict resolution and what we kind of like throw off to like grievances if you have this ability. But of course, our problem is that we can't do that different material conditions. So we have to figure out our own way, right? Um, other, in terms of general things where you can just speak generally about libertarian socialists, it will look a lot like parliamentary procedure. Uh, you don't wanna get stuck in that mode, but like there's an agenda. Right. And then you go through the agenda. Each agenda item has a time limit. Uh, you want, you know, a st mechanism like a stack. You know, the stack is a basically libertarian socialist. You know, like, I mean, it's not a libertarian socialist invention. Nobody invented it. But like, you know, it's 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 it was more it was more prominent among like anarchist movements before it got adopted in like DSA, um, you know, and, um, you know, the, the it's all the stuff that you expect from like, you know, DSA working group meetings, basically except with extra care to make sure that like, for example, the agenda is something that is brought up at the beginning, but if anybody has amendments to the agenda, you take time at the beginning to make those amendments. Um, if somebody makes a proposal and somebody wants to modify the proposal, you have some kind of system like the IWW has in Rusty's rules for making sure that everyone knows what they're voting on. That's the, the, I forget what it's called, but the scribe basically. And they have like a very ritualized, formalized procedure for making, announcing it every time it's been changed so that everybody knows what's being voted on and that kind of thing. Um, so a lot of these techniques are not going to be unfamiliar to you. The difference is when you're trying to do it in a direct democratic manner, you try to take into account all the ways that it can go wrong and create these kinds of like, you know, sometimes procedures, sometimes rules, but oftentimes just kind of like cultural soft rituals that you can use to diffuse those situations. So that's, I hope that that was a direct enough answer to the question and not a dodge. Yeah, no, that was, that was really, really helpful. No, that was definitely not a dodge. Um, if anybody wants to bring up any questions, just use the um, raise hand button in the reactions. I'll wait for everybody to give everybody a minute. Um, just wanted to bring up another question. You brought up, you know, like the different revolutionary movements uh, and moments, sorry, not movements. Um, I mean, we live in a bourgeois democratic society. If we were to have, say, like a, a revolutionary libertarian socialist movement um, that has enough of a, a um, you know, on the ground power, how, how would, what would that look like in case, let's say, there's another crisis of capitalism um, in, you know, six, six years? And in the six years, we have built up that, um, you know, that movement. I'm just hypothesizing here. How would that movement approach that revolutionary movement? How it should approach that revolutionary moment? Because the way we have seen, um, you know, with like the Bernie movement and other things that have popped up, they have tried to take state power in some limited way and say, well, you know, we're going to elect this executive. He's going to pass some things, and then they, life would get better. How should such a movement, um, when and hopefully if and when it is developed, approach such revolutionary moments that pop up? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, and it's tough because I want to preface anything that I have to say with no answer that I give is going to be the correct answer because no one person has the correct answer for this. This is precisely the sort of thing that all of us coming from our different perspectives or different life experiences and therefore our different frameworks that we develop as a result of them, like have to kind of butt our heads together and kind of like figure out gropingly which way to go. It's not something that any one person can say. But if you're asking for my opinion, which is a different thing, I think that we are, I, I have the same time scale as you in my head, five to 10 years away from major conflagrations that are either at the scale of 2020 or more so. And what we decide to do with our time between now and then will make a big difference because when that happens, are we just looking from the sidelines like impotently and like not and flailing around and not knowing what to do? And then 
none of the working class people who are looking for answers because everything is so screwed up go with us. Maybe a lot more of them go with the fascists, right? Like that's a possibility. Um, and there is another possible world where, you know, we've built up something, which is like at the very least a proof of concept for the kinds of things that we might need. And then when the shit goes down, people join us because the situation happens. We have an analysis of the situation that's like, this is what went wrong. This is how we fix it. We're already doing the thing that we think is the fixing. It's very attractive to people. So people join us. That's what happened in Rojava, you know. They were building that movement for decades before 2011 happened. Um, and then, you know, 2011 happened and Rojava happened. And it wasn't magic. It was like the decades of organizing beforehand. Same thing with the CNTFAI in Spain. They had been running their anarcho syndicalist union as a radical direct democracy for 50 years, organizing workplaces and doing all the things that unions do, like fighting for higher wages, going on strike, you know, organizing against the boss, all that other stuff. But they were also doing a radical direct democracy because they knew that one day they were going to take over the factories. They didn't know how or when. They had theories like the general strike, which turned out not to be true, right? It's not how it happened. But when it happened, they were in a position where they were like, we're the CNTFAI. This is what we stand for. This is what we're already doing. Join us. And they went from like, I don't know, 100,000 to like a million, like poof, like this, right? That's how it happens. So for me, it's a question of not wasting our time, uh, you know, barking up, you know, trees where there's no fruit. Sorry, that was mixing up metaphors there. But, you know, like DSA, there were people in DSA from like 2015 on uh, pushing for mutual aid, right? Mm -hmm. To name an example that's near and dear to, uh, you know, Philly DSA's heart because a lot of people in this room are in the MOG, right? Uh, they not only refused, right? Like the leadership, quote unquote, of the organization, but actively sabotaged to the point of like making it impossible to do anything in certain chapters. So severely did they sabotage the democratic process in order to prevent mutual aid from coming about as if it was like the worst possible thing in the world. And then when COVID happens and like civil society organizations outside of DSA, just everybody's doing mutual aid, including ordinary people who've never organized in their life, then we tail the rest of society doing mutual aid, right? Like, for me, I don't know what the right thing is with any certainty, but I know that that's not the right thing, right? Because it's not like there were no voices in DSA saying we should, hey, we should try this out. And it's not like doing that would have taken away from like electoralism or any of the other things that people wanted to do that so much that they destroyed entire chapters to block it. Uh, but, you know, they, um, but apparently uh, that was what, ended up happening because that's the way that the, that the dice rolled. Um, I mean, people struggled against it, but we failed uh, in that respect until we did, not right? Because I mean, then things changed. But imagine what we could have built if we had had those years first, right? Like, that's the thing. What do we lose as a result of that silliness? So, you know, I look now at a situation where DSA could have spent the last, like, you know, five, six years you know, with all the millions of dollars that we poured into elections that we either lost or produced people electeds who have delivered nothing for us, which, you know, to be fair, some electeds have delivered wonderfully for us. I was in Brooklyn until very recently, and Julia Salazar delivered rent control. She's fantastic. I love her. Um, you know, like, I'm sure that she has problems as a politician, but like that directly affected my life so much so that Eric Adams wants to take it away now, right? But like, there's a lot of electeds who either lost their races or have done nothing. Some of them have even betrayed us, right? What if we had taken just some of the millions that we poured basically down the drain and poured them into, for example, an investment fund for cooperatives, perhaps even cooperatives that we give grants to as an organization based on our own needs, like this harassment and grievance process, Resolution 33, that has never worked and will never work because it like, you know, requires volunteers to do the impossible uh, and like, you know, with no training and no resources and maybe like one staffer when they edited it. Um, what if we just like funded a conflict resolution and restorative justice cooperative with professionals who are like trained social workers or trained whatever, and we gave them like a hundred thousand dollar grant or a two hundred thousand dollar grant. DSA, this is within DSA's power to do. 
it's industrial policy. It's the kind of thing that like, you know, liberals expect or social Democrats expect governments to do. And, oh, we're not the government yet, so we can't do it. Except like every successful socialist movement oftentimes has built up independent institutions first, right? And yeah, it requires money, but you know what? Money's not that scary if it's under democratic control, but look at DSA's funds. How have those been allocated? Can you tell me what the treasury was? It's a lot more transparent than it was under the 2017 NPC, um, which made a real shambles of it and hid the fact that the organization was basically bankrupt for years until they got out of the red. Uh, the but like you know like how how much are the funds under the control of the rank and file? The, these are all questions that I think are very unpleasant for us to tackle. But if you're if, if you're asking me and in my individual opinion after years of organizing a DSA, what what kind of things we can be doing to prepare? I think that it would be changing our investment portfolio, not to get rid of the electoralism, but to put it in its rightful place at like. 40% of our efforts while building up the kinds of institutions that are under direct control of the working classes that actually help us accomplish goals in the here and now, and also are those attractive, um, you know, institutions that in a crisis people will flock to because it is the future and it works. Uh, that's my opinion. Other people obviously disagree. Um, yeah, um, no, that's that's really really good um, answer. And um, you know, speaking of mutual aid and COVID, not really a libertarian socialist or an anarchist organization, but I always give this example of the Communist Party of India, Marxist, which is a Marxist party. It's in their name. When COVID started in the uh, state of Kerala, which actually they had their government there, uh, their um, trade union sect, I think, is AICTU. I think All India Trade Union. Um, they formed, um, they were, they, they didn't wait for the government. They actually said, well, at this port uh, or at these locations, people are going to come into the state, people are going to return back home. So it is going to cause um, a better, a, a, uh, you know, a higher chance of, of spread. So they installed um, hand sanitization stations. They didn't wait for the government to do it, but they were just ready for it. Um, yeah. So uh, does anybody have any questions that they wanted to bring up? And if you have, just type stack or just uh, raise your hand with the reactions bar at the bottom. It should have a reaction bar. Just do any reaction. You don't have to raise your hand. I'll just give it a few minutes. But um, the, uh, the other thing is that uh, there's a couple comments in here. I don't know if I, I won't yeah, name yeah, sure. names, yeah. but there's yeah, some really cool. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's one person, names, yeah. one person brings up a uh, tech mill is a good technique that the YPG uses for self crit after actions. Uh, that's a really great point. So tech mill is uh, self criticism, which is actually descended from the very ugly, in my opinion, and uh, dangerous kind of self criticism practiced by Maoists during the Cultural Revolution. But the way that it evolved, because you know the, the YPG are ex Maoists, that was their politics in like the nineties. But the, the way that it evolved kind of in the last couple of decades as they moved in this more libertarian socialist direction is in this, um, in a way that integrated these safeguards to make it so that it's not like a pile on on somebody or an easily manipulatable event where somebody dislikes somebody else for some other reason. And then they can like, you know, organize a self crit to basically like humiliate the person into suicide or whatever. Like the, the, they basically like structure it in such a way as to be like a low intensity thing where everybody kind of goes around and kind of talks about things that they could have done better. And it has like more of like a report back feel. Um, and there are many testimonials. I mean, I haven't witnessed it myself. So perhaps it is actually much more toxic than, than people think. I, I can't say, honestly, uh, the, uh, my instinct is to be skeptical of it, but if it indeed is that like more pared down and chill, uh, process, um, that, that people talk about, it is indeed something that we could learn from um, the, uh, and then somebody else said, uh, we founded our local thinking about mutual aid and we started in 2015 and have worked through about three hurricanes and I guess whatever comes next. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's, but does anyone else, I mean, questions or comments? I mean, feel free to, to, to be rude and abrasive about any of my own rude and abrasive 
uh, statements. Um, Yeah, if you just want to drop your questions or comments in the chat, um, DMs your icon, read out that as well. Because if, if you don't want to get on mic or. Oh, yeah. 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 So I, I can ask a question. So, JMC, I'm not sure how, how involved in like immediate DSA you are, but um, what would you say like are like the top? kind of like projects that one could get involved with now, be it like labor organizing, tenant organizing, mutual aid, um, given that like within DSA, certain paths have been sort of foreclosed, right? Like there's no, there's no kind of municipalist electoral project that's going to reasonably get started uh, and, and get any traction. There's no sort of like, you know, um, like other, there's other stuff that's like, just like not gonna happen. So like what, do you think is the most like kind of fertile ground for building kind of a libertarian socialist poll within uh, DSA as an organization? Yeah, so I mean, on the local level, which is probably where people can do the most. I mean, the things that people have been attracted to in the last couple of years have been, and I'm sure that you guys know this, um, it's not a special revelation to say it, tenants organizing because of especially like the, the, the intensity of the rent problem and the homelessness problem in most renter cities. Uh, that's been like a major uh, thing that a lot of people have tried to do uh, with mixed success. Um, and mutual aid disaster relief has been the other one, like creating, um, you know, mutual aid organizations or informal networks. Sometimes one works better than the other, uh, depending on your circumstances, that like respond to an immediate disaster, but also develop the capability of responding to a disaster like in the future because they they build up like permanent uh, relationships. Um, that those can be really effective. There were disaster relief uh, efforts that had to do with like you know the fires in California or with like Hurricane Sandy that persisted uh, into COVID. And uh, the one that I have direct experience of is the Bushwick Community Garden uh, and uh, Woodbine. Woodbine being also a part of symbiosis that were able to feed um, thousands of families for like a full two weeks uh, when basically like everything shut down at the very beginning of COVID, like things were really bad in New York uh, and people were having trouble getting their groceries and they were able to feed them, not from the garden, but from like things that they were able to requisition in an emergency um, through donations and through like, you know, people uh, joining in to volunteer in the pre-existing volunteer hour system that they had set up, right? So that's another example of people hopping on in a crisis if you have the pre-existing germ. Uh, the other thing that's popped up that um, is like really recent is that with the great resignation um, or the tight labor market, as the economists call it, uh, there are huge opportunities for labor organizing that just did not exist before that now exists. And I think that that's something that people can really leverage. Uh, that's not my idea. Actually, Adam is the one who said it in a private conversation. So just uh, full credit where it's due that that's, uh, that that's a real material shift. Um, the, uh, I, I don't think that that takes away from pre-existing strategies, but it's definitely, it definitely shows that like, we need to make more like investments of time in that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, I think that the approach that has been prominent within DSA is like salting a particular industry on purpose. That can work, but given the labor situation, it might be the kind of thing where people organizing in their own workplace around problems that exist like right there, like whether you want more remote work and like, you know, you had it, the company wants to take it away and a lot of people are pissed, right? Uh, you know, or whether you want to have like, you know, safer working conditions because, um, you know, you work in some like direct food processing uh, or customer facing or other environment where like, you know, it's like really tight and in person, the job has to be done in person, but they're not giving you protection for COVID. Like you can organize around that. Like there's all sorts of things that are now much more possible because capitalists are afraid to fire people in an environment where they're not getting enough labor, particularly for any job that has to do in person, like Amazon warehouses, uh, which is uh, kind of one of the material conditions that that made the, uh, the the Amazon union attempt so much more successful now, I would argue, than previous ones. So that's definitely something that DSA should 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 uh, should try to get an arm into. I think that part of the problem is, from a libertarian socialist perspective, um, 
it's tough within the existing syndicalist union, the IWW, for a lot of reasons to um, to kind of like make a concerted, coordinated effort to increase those because the methods that they use for organizing new shops are more like people come to them rather than it being like a you know more coordinated direction of people who are already in the milieu. So. Uh, you know, it would be nice if we if we had a cynical union that was on top of like that kind of thing. I think that the, the although I should say the Wobblies have also done amazing work doing organizing in industries that nobody had touched before. And actually, like that's that's and laying the groundwork in many ways for a lot of the recent victories and like the Amazon and uh, and other cases. So I don't want to trash them too bad. But like, you know, there are proposals within the Wobblies to have this more kind of like campaign type system uh, that have kind of been very political. And there's been all sorts of stuff uh, going on in there that has kind of prevented that from happening. But maybe that's something the DSA could do through its labor committee. I don't know. But the other thing I would say, and, you know, the, the stuff that I was talking about, about large scale investments in like cooperative development, or even in like the development of like our own, um, you know, skills internally, like, you know, um, why doesn't the organization direct resources towards creating more like people who can give like, you know, a, a really rousing speech? I know that sounds like a random thing, but it's historically a very important part of propagandizing for radical movements. And it's kind of a lost skill set. What if we had a public speaking prize, right? And the and the prize is not just a cash prize, but it's the it's like a giving a speaking tour across the country, right? And uh, you know the about a speech that has to do with socialism, and you do it from memory, like that would that would spur a lot of people to want to actually like develop that that skill, and then you could have like working groups that do it. It's like oh well, that doesn't have anything directly to do with organizing, sure until you're like at that like you know amorphous protest that nobody knows whether it's going to go one way or the other way and then you're able to like make an intervention that makes it in a much more radical direction that's a skill set right that we could cultivate like I, I i think and same thing with the cooperative thing that i was saying before like we could have like you know large scale dsa funds doing this on an ongoing basis and not just have it be the npc's creature but have them be like you know under some form or other of direct democratic control of the membership if, for example, we had a functioning referendum system to make decisions in between conventions, but that's another thing that didn't happen. So I think that there's things that we can do to build up our capacity, to put it in a more positive and not a negative way. And that's what I would want us to focus on, whether it's like building up our capacity to organize within like the tight labor market or building up our capacity to do disaster relief, building up our capacity to uh, build co-ops and have those co-ops build our capacity in other ways in a virtuous cycle right like because they help dsa in some way i think that this is this is the kind of thing that we could do that would make the most of our five to ten years and not the least yes there thanks thank you so much for that answer james that was great um there's one question that came um i think we can use this question and wrap up um it is how do we insist on our principles and build without falling into the disorganized groups and micro sectarianism that's plagued the left. Yeah, I mean, I, I wish I had the answer to that. There, there are those who would call me a micro sectarian for, you know, having my 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 self critiques of 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 the org, um, you know, that I just outlined, um, and picking on people and picking scabs of old fights that we should all move on from and all this other stuff, you know, so. I get it. Like it's tough. The it's very easy to fall into factionalism. I think that there are soft cultural things that help, like the old DSA civility norms. You know, call people in, don't call them out. Like you know, try to uh, step up, step back. Like all that, all that stuff. I think that there's like a little virtue ethics there that keeps people if they really like try to do that in good faith. But then of course the problem is that those things are then militarized by people who are not acting in good faith as a way of like you know stamping on the opinions of others and uh, preventing them from dissenting in a sectarian way so it's you know i don't know it's it's a very complicated dance if i had the answer to that i don't know i would have a lot more social skills than i do i guess all i can say is that um we have to try both like as dsa but then also within dsa to create spaces where people really trust each other and people have the kinds of relationships where they've got each other's back, right? 
not like, you know, fr- best friends for life or anything, but like, you know, you know that if you get in trouble, somebody's going to help you out. You know that like, you know, somebody's going to stick up for you if you're being bullied, blah, 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 blah. And if you can start with those kinds of spaces and those kinds of relationships and kind of have the soft social skills, civility norms to kind of maintain the peace in them, then you can work together. And if you can work together, then you have labor power. And if you have labor power, then you can do production. And, you know, then it's a matter of deciding what kind of production you want to do and what's the better and the worst kinds of production. I, if you're focused on the task, like I want to build a tenants union in this city in five years. If it, like if that's something that you as an individual, maybe even as a group, like if you're able to get the consensus for it, like decide on and you're like focused on that, then the the stuff about the disputes between this faction and that faction and this clique and that clique will be secondary. It won't go away because I mean that's just life, right? I mean, like church groups have that. Like, you know, there's no escaping it. It's human sociality. People who people who think that that if DSA didn't exist, there would not be like all the like, you know, inside outsider kind of dynamics that's deluding yourself. Like, you know, we've any, any organization of group uh, of coordinated people will have these kinds of tribalistic dynamics. It's just how people are, but nevertheless, people can do great things together. So I think that that's kind of like, um, you know, maybe the happy medium is focus on the task, try to build up the kinds of relationships where you can really work together and then just kind of buckle down and hope for the best, you know? And if, it, and if it fails, then you try again and you kind of throw things at the wall until you see what sticks. And maybe that's something that you can do inside DSA. Maybe you have to go outside DSA for a while. Maybe you come back, you know, I don't know. I mean, DSA is not the end all be all of the socialist movement either. Um, the party is not the movement, even in the best of cases. And it's not entirely clear that DSA is the party. Uh, so the, the, you know, like there's, there's lots of different, people who are trying to do lots of different things. And I think that we have to have diversity of tactics. I mean, not, now I just sound like a cliche anarchist, but what can you do? Like you have to have a diversity of tactics and you have to kind of like, you know, try to support each other best you can and hope that it's enough to prevent the powers that be from crushing us into dust. Yes, let's hope that. Um, just gonna thank you so much, James, for joining us. This was a great, great intro for people. Um, and uh, this should be on YouTube. I know later than tomorrow, I will send out an email with all the resources that uh, GMC was kind enough to forward us. It's just mostly just articles. <clears throat> I would highly encourage people to read them. Um, and from our side, from Philly DSA, we have one more event um, like this on Wednesday, which is about Philippines and the left there, which is being hosted by a young group of left-wing Filipino diaspora organizers called the Anak Bayan. And then on Saturday, which is the 23rd, we have Socialism 101. Um, and then after that, uh, next Wednesday, we're actually having a Marxism reading group where we're reading some Marxists from the Global South. Um, like uh, I think we're reading Jose, Carle- Jose Carlos Mariatogi, Bhagat Singh from India, and then Marla Harnaker. So if anybody wants to join that, I will send that out as well. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, for joining. This is this has been great. And, uh, you know, I hope to see more of you soon and hopefully in person soon.